Top Med Talk. Welcome to Top Med Talk. We are here in Washington, D.C. for the American Society for Enhanced Recovery Annual Meeting. I'm Desiree Chapel, host of the Roundtable on Top Med Talk. I'm the managing editor, but I'm also joined here by Monty Mythen, editor-in-chief of Top Med Talk. Hello, Monty. Hi, Desiree, who's also your sound guy You today. are running the guy desk. Today. You are because running the desk. So we're in the um, exhibit hall. We have a booth here in the exhibit area um, at the meeting, and we've run into a friend of ours, Eric Zimmerman, with Enhanced Medical Nutrition. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for letting me drop yeah, by. We roped you in, <laughs> actually. <laughs> then sit down and talk to us. Hey, you. Come over here and talk. Hey, you. Uh, so um, why are you here at the American and Society for Enhanced Recovery? So, um, I mean, obviously, Enhanced Recovery is a passion for us. Uh, we are a university-based uh, startup that focuses on clinical nutrition, especially as it relates to surgery. And that brings us to, you know, as many meetings as, as we can, because this is where all the, the early adopters and, and really all the, the innovative information um, comes, to, uh, comes to play. So, um, yeah, no, it's exciting to be here. Yeah, have you um, had a chance to talk to uh, any of the delegates yet, or still kind of warming up a little bit this yeah, morning? Yeah, you know, we, we spoke to a number uh, this morning just about learning, uh, you know, more about the complexity of how you uh, implement clinical nutrition within uh, a pathway, and it's 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 interesting. Not to be pessimistic, um, because I think it is uh, optimistic, but. It, it, you know, the more we talk to delegates, the more we learn that we've got a long way to go. Yep. And even though, uh, uh, you know, enhanced recovery protocols, evidence-based medicine, you know, we were moving towards that in surgery. We've been at it for a long time and we, you know, there's still a ton uh, of institutions and, and the reality is that, um, you know, the, the bar is, is pretty low in terms of, of where we need to go. Um, mm-hmm. But it's exciting because that's why we're all here. Yeah, for sure. So what are you, you guys are focused on the new pre-op nutrition piece or tell me a little bit about yeah. what you guys are, yeah, so are bl- doing. Believe it or not, we, um, we spun out of university and uh, we had a big focus in um, immunonutrition and, and just how do you modulate the immune response in and around mm-hmm. surgery. We, we, we kind of took really a lot of pearls of wisdom out of that and have now uh, been focusing more on protein metabolism, so more in the prehabilitation phase. Uh, and then we support uh, preoperative carbohydrate loading uh, as well. Um, and I think, uh, the one piece that we're interested to discover more about is we're a Canadian company. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're from up North and, and implementing enhanced recovery in a, uh, different type of healthcare system is, uh, is challenging. So Eric, can the sarcopenic elderly patient build muscle in a reasonable time frame with the right protein nutritional support? Or is it just that that's part of getting old and yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the phenomena is, um, uh, you know, it, it is, as you mentioned, part of getting old. But uh, the question that we get uh, when we're evaluating, uh, you know, how to incorporate prehabilitation programs is what's the least amount of time that I need yeah. to be able to optimize my patient? And typically, uh, you know, we come at it from the opposite side, which is what, how much time do we have and what's the most amount of time that mm. we can uh, optimize someone uh, before surgery and uh, even if we can't build muscle how do we at- attenuate the loss of that muscle and the protein loading will attenuate the loss exactly so um, this is where we um, you know this is really our bread and butter of understanding how do you elicit um, uh, you know that response that you're looking for um, in muscle protein synthesis and um, you know, really advocating for the fact that not all proteins are created equal. Mm. There's certain amino acid profiles uh, that really turn on the light of okay. stimulating muscle proteins. Because I was just about to ask you, are there, are there some? Do you have some favorite magic proteins? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, the the magic uh, really, when you talk about protein, um, is um, specific to uh, um, an amino acid that's called leucine. Yep. Um, so that's really the most important uh, component of a profile when you're looking at a protein. Um, but funny enough, uh, what we've actually been focusing on lately is is we know we cover um, really A to Z of amino acid profiles and you know deep science around muscle protein synthesis, but compliance is actually the most important metric of clinical nutrition. It okay. doesn't matter how well your science works. If nobody's going to take it, it's going nowhere. And that's something that's usually completely overlooked. And is the technology moving in that space? Are they starting to, you know, uh, put 
smart chips in drinking devices connected yeah. to the sound of it going down your throat and so <laughs> we know that, that you Art Maud is, dr- is actually drinking <laughs> because it's getting into the it, it appears to be getting yeah, into the so body there's yeah. tracers you can use right. actually to measure um uh, friendly tracers the tracer always sounds a bit scary yes so, you know. yeah they are friendly um Typically, uh, the easiest way to um, uh, to measure compliance is, is by uh, patients Patient taking reported. taking pictures mm. ah. of what mm. they've consumed because uh, you know it's such a tech savvy age, um, or bringing back empties, um, which is yeah exactly <laughs> caps or the caps exactly <laughs> yeah, um, to show us that you've you've uh, you've been following the let's say the prehab protocol uh, that we've been advocating for. What is the time frame that you guys are looking at? So it's interesting. We were, yeah, we were just uh, we had a big round round table session at Duke this week um, uh, with Dr. Phillips, who's a protein metabolism expert, one of our clinical advisors, uh, as well as with uh, Dr. Rich Meyer and, and kind of the um, you know the, the Duke team, and we're looking to evaluate muscle protein synthesis by um, measuring uh, muscle with with ultrasound, mm-hmm. and the goal is to identify a window between one to two weeks. Uh, to see if we can we can get it done within that time frame because the feasibility of when does the patient come in for a pre-op admission meeting to when are we going to surgery? I think the reality for a lot of programs is you know two to four weeks is is a typical time frame, uh, mm-hmm. so we need to work within that uh, realistically. So the ultrasound a, a leg muscle they select and look at the cross-sectional area, do they? And are there f- cleverer measures in there? Do they start to count how? good the fibers yeah, are whether so there's certain streaks of because we're hearing before about sort of the kobe beef phenomenon and <laughs> fat yeah, in the muscle and <laughs> well, so glycogen stores so, and yeah and the folks at duke um are really um trying to identify what is the best marker because more might not be better yeah. mm-hmm. um so being able to identify muscle glycogen and look deeper into the profile of the muscle to understand mm. what's the best endpoint that we can uh, that we can come up with is is really the big area of interest because intuitively we know you know a patient who's malnourished or undernourished or sarcopenic is less likely to do well with an invasive surgery but how can we actually effectively measure the difference in uh, in muscle change or the lack of uh, change because we've attenuated mm-hmm. the loss um, and that's what we're, we're we're hoping we can do with a high quality uh, protein isolate that contains leucine as well as by measuring that with ultrasound. And like many things in medicine is our personal individualized response to the protein opportunity from the supplementation vary as well. Are, we, are yes. some of us better at using certain amino acids? So I think, I mean, that's probably the future of personalized medicine oh. is understanding how you everyone metabolizes different micro and, and macronutrients. Um, but what we've focused on is, uh, you know, what's commonly referred to as evidence-based protein intake. Mm. And that's based on how much you weigh and how sick you are. Mm. So... Um, you know, typical ICU would, would be perhaps 2.5 grams per kilo of body weight um, per day, which ends up being a pretty high that's, target, that's right? That's uh, a lot of steak. It, it, well, a lot and, of chicken. And the, pro- <laughs> the challenge with that is... a second for me. If we're right. going to get our yeah, protein exactly. from that's, vegetables. That's kind of like a challenge T-bone. In <laughs> it, eat this and you it's can a few, have the a old 96er. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a few, but, but the reality for us is the patients are never going to be consuming those no, no. Um, post-operatively. Uh, or preoperatively, especially if they've just undergone, you know, chemo or radiation. Yeah. Um, so you need interventions that pack a high punch. Yeah. Uh, you can only actually metabolize 25 uh, to 30 mm. grams of protein in one setting. Mm. So even if you ate 10 steaks right this minute, yep. you'd only be able to metabolize a small percentage mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. And volume uh, plays a big role. These patients aren't consuming massive amounts of, of anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you need to be able to, uh, you know, work within that, that framework, I guess. And where, where do you stand? We were talking about this a little bit earlier on. Uh, we've got into the habit in intensive care, goodness knows how, mm-hmm. into giving food continuously, whereas that's not, the, that's not what we do. We, we, we take food in boluses. We take, you know, you eat, rest, eat, rest. And we interviewed, oh, Hugh Montgomery interviewed yep. one of our colleagues talking about a bolus feeding project when we were at the Intensive Care Society in mm-hmm. London last December. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where do you stand on, on Yeah, on so that? that's fascinating research and we can't wait for that to be published <laughs> um, because, again, we know that, um, uh, you know, bolus is most likely a preferred method 
um, especially just just based on the reality of uh, you know patients that are are mobile and um, also the fact that we know nutrition has has a you know positive impact. You know, exercise plays yeah. a role within, uh, especially you know, a prehabilitation program. And when you combine them together, uh, that's when you get the best response. So that bolus, we want that to happen uh, right after exercise, yeah. and we want to focus on that as opposed to um, you know, typically, in, uh, especially in the ICU setting of of the continuous. And is it? A, uh, it's when people have been telling it's certain of the amino acid peaks that that are mm. one of the key switches or drivers. Could we mimic that with an IV bolus? Well, I mean, that was a topic of conversation this week. <laughs> um, uh, unfortunately, you know, we're not there yet. Um, right. Enteral is 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 really what we've been uh, what we've been focused on. Um, which you can still bolus. I mean, we, we refer to it as a protein flush typically. Yeah. Through but do we know? Does it have to go via the portal? So does it need to go that exactly. way in to have yes. the? Yes. Okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'd be you know uh, through your NG or your yep. um, any of the other tube feeding methods. That's that's typically what um, you know what it's geared towards. Right. Gotcha. So um, when we have just a couple more minutes, mm-hmm. but we were briefly touching on um, adoption of of you know immunonutrition and, and nutritional support with enhanced recovery here in the U.S. And you were saying that I mean, do you feel like it's kind of taking off here? Yeah, I think definitely. Um, I mean, we we support enhanced recovery all over the world, and I think um, the U.S. has done a, a great job of of kind of taking the baton and uh, and and really kind of focusing on on how can we. Uh, we implement this, but I think uh, a big challenge for programs, and we deal with this a lot in, in Canada, is a lot of the times we start bottom up. So mm-hmm. a few passionate clinicians really pushing, advocating for change, running around trying to convince people to get on board, um, and that can be tough, especially when you're only working one subspecialty at a time, mm-hmm. versus looking at this more systematically. We have great data for a whole whack of procedures. Um, I think, you know, it would be better served for, for institutions who are thinking about this to, to try and uh, understand how you might be able to do it top down, get buy-in from administration, find your champions, build your team, um, and approach it more systematically versus trying to get small win after small win and, and, and climbing the mountain that way. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Well, Eric, thank you so much for sitting down with us and chatting. Hopefully we can catch up again this summer, I think, at the, the prehab meeting at Yes, Empong. yeah, prehab yeah. in, I think, Chicago. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll have yeah, a so chance to catch Prehab up. in London. Yes. Prehab in, in London, yeah. yeah so oh, that's there you go. at the yeah. uh, org. We'll yeah. get you there. And then there is the EBPOM USA meeting in Chicago. In Chicago, yeah. Yeah, which will also... We'll get into it as well. But the London one, which has the first two days of the yeah. three-day Focus EPPOM meeting, the is the Prehab World World Congress. Ooh, yes. There we go. So lots of, uh, lots of protein discussion there. Yeah. You hear yeah. more about amino acids than you would have done for the rest of your life. Yeah. For some of us. For some of us. That's true. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us again, Eric. And I uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks again. Thanks, Thanks Eric. Top talk. Nick Majerison here. Thank you for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, make sure you've subscribed to Top Med Talk on your podcatcher or however it is that you're listening to us at the moment. And you're spoilt for choice. We're on pretty much every single podcast platform you could think of. Uh, So make sure you've subscribed. Make sure you've engaged with us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and make sure you've signed up for our email updates on topmedtalk.com. If you get yourself there, you'll find a website that contains all of the podcasts that we've ever done and it gives you the chance to sign up for our email updates. That way we can always get in touch with you and tell you what we're up to. Oh, and while you're online, check out ebpom.org forward slash meetings. While you're there, get excited about EBPOM London 2019, the London Perioperative Medicine Congress. It's on July the 2nd, and it's one of many meetings that EBPOM organises around the world in order to communicate the perioperative medicine message. Have a look, ebpom.org forward slash meetings.